to this Henderson County Board of Education meeting. Today is July the 15th, 2019, and call this meeting to order while I'm waiting for Ms. Tracy to move back. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. Um, it is with a heavy heart this evening that we ask for thoughts and prayers with the, fair, the friends and the family of Miss Cindy Williams. She will be dearly missed. If you take a moment for her family, please. Thank you, everyone. I have new Pledge of Allegiance ambassadors in the back. I believe I have the Thompson children to help lead us. Thank you all, you did a great job. Moving on to the approval of the agenda, um, please note that there was an owner, um, added owner contract agreement for the soccer field lighting at Henderson County High School's project action. It is part of number three under um, miscellaneous reports. So please note that that's added to the agenda. Is there anyone, any other additions or changes do we hear of? Hearing none, I look for a motion to approve the agenda as listed with the addition. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Do I, um, do I hear a second? Kirk, thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to uh, sesquicentennial spotlight. In honor of Henderson County Schools, 150 school history, we, our committee, and Mr. Ryan Rush went on a little adventure under South Middle School to discover a, an old fallout shelter and the artifacts. So here's a short clip of that. There are artifacts from the 1960s that are located under South Middle School when it was um, used for a fallout shelter. We put this video out on Facebook and we had a lot of comments of uh, former students that remember that from when it was City High. We had a reach of about 7,000 people of that video and then the week later Channel 14 called and wanted to do an, a whole story about that. Um, so that is also on Channel 14's website and on their social media. They interviewed Mr. Rush and um, all kinds of information, and he showed them some of the artifacts that were found. Um, Mr. Rush also donated the stuff you see here. He donated some of those items to the depot uh, community room for their history display, and they were very excited. Um, one of the members of their history committee also tried one of those survival, survival crackers from the 1960s. She was pretty brave. Um, she said it still tasted fresh, so that's our uh, school history spotlight. did not wear heels that day, I wore boots. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Megan. Moving on to student and staff recognition, Miss Morgana. Sure, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, this is July and we don't have any students today that we are going to recognize. And most of the time throughout the school year, our staff that I recognized are in our school or part of our leadership at the school level. So tonight I'd like to take just a few minutes and do a few staff recognitions. Um, and so the first person I would like to recognize and I would like the people to stand as I do this would be Robin Newton. <laughs> 
Robin Newton, it is a time to recognize you because we appreciate all the work that you do for the school board, for us at the district office, and for all of our schools and our students. You manage our office. You take care of us. You advise us. At times, you farm out phone calls. You are always pleasant in responses, regardless who may call or come calling in the office in person. You have a vast knowledge of our policies and procedures. You collaborate with Kentucky School Board Association, and you're also a part um, of your professional organization. And I know previously you have served as an officer and have um, represented Henderson County Schools very well in an extraordinary fashion. And so tonight I just wanted us to show an appreciation for the work that Robin Newton does for us. so much yes the next person I wanted to recognize who is not with us tonight but Caleb is and we're much appreciative of Caleb but I also wanted to recognize Stephen Johnson you know he is here early at every board meeting helping get things set up make sure our computers are working that we're logged in that the microphones the sound system is working and so I want to make sure that um, he is recognized in the minutes as well and we welcome Caleb to continue that charge and um, hopefully we'll get Stephen in person back so we can tell him thank you also. Yes. Oh, we'll, we'll do those in a minute. I'll do those. You're okay. You're okay. I thought they, we will certainly recognize them in just a minute. Um, another person that I'd like to recognize this evening is um, Steve Steiner for his leadership across the district. You seem to bring a sort of energy to us that is unique and and much appreciated it certainly is and if you didn't know recently um, he has collaborated with Megan Mortis and they created a safe school video I'm pretty sure last year throughout the year you all saw bits and pieces of it it was submitted to the Kentucky Center of School Safety because they put out an email asking any school district who had put together some sort of video about school safety to send it in and so we had already done that, and we sent ours in, and they um, selected it. And so actually at KASA later in this week, um, he will be there along with Megan Mortis and um, AJ and to accept the award um, that across the state that they'll be using our production on um, the center from s the Center of School Safety. So, Mr. Steiner, thank you for your leadership. Appreciate it. I also would like to mention Miss Nancy Gibson, if she would stand. <laughs> you can tell they're so thrilled. Um, but to thank you for the connections that you make throughout our community. Um, you have um, built a great uh, rapport in our health field with collaborative partners, with mental health, with service providers, with Community Methodist Hospital, with our nurses and health care and the medical needs of our students. But also, she has taken great leadership because mid-year last year, I shifted some roles and responsibilities. Sometimes that's not always the easiest thing to do or to deliver new messages. And when I went to Nancy, she took that on um, as a champion and immediately started working in the elementary field on instruction and curriculum and um, always did that with a smile on her face regardless if she was smiling when she went home when she was in the office working, you would have never known um, that she wasn't pleased to service the kids at Henderson County Schools. So, Ms. Gibson, I appreciate your leadership as well. <laughs> and, of course, tonight I couldn't forget Cindy Clotier because she loves to stand up in front of people. <laughs> <laughs> but, Cindy, the comments that I would like to say about you this evening is the appreciation of the intentionality that you have for our finances in the Henderson County Schools. When we started together five years ago, we learned by that April, we had to reduce our budget by $7.1, $7.2 million. And our contingency was going to be in the red if we didn't do that. So upon her advice, upon staffing, upon leadership from her department, we now sit with a contingency that's above 7%. She does like to say no very often, and we're okay with that. 
Um, sometimes we have to negotiate with her. But she says no and still keeps our classrooms and our students at heart to make sure if I do have to come back and go, we have to have another kindergarten teacher, that she understands that and still is able to manage our finances to where we're at. Cindy Cloutier, you rock. <laughs> rock. So for this evening, just a couple other folks to mention. Our new Director of Public Information is Miss Megan Mortis, that we're very proud of her work. If you would stand, yes. <laughs> you have worked diligently your years with the Henderson County School in branding Henderson County, and um, that is much appreciated, uh, the work that you do and the rapport that you have. We appreciate it, and I'm going to give a shout out to Chad Thompson. Just wait till the end of next year. <laughs> but um, he comes, we welcome him to our district office. And our flagship is and always has been, I'm sure, Henderson County High School. And he has led that charge well. When I worked with the SBDM to find his replacement, they just kept saying, number one, can we just have him back one more year? Well, and then the second thing request was, when I said, I really don't think we can do that, the second request was, can you find someone just like him? So you, we appreciate your leadership, and we welcome you into our central office and continuing to work with Henderson County kids. So that ends our recognition for this evening. And if our student ambassadors would stand and be recognized, it is Raylan Overfield, Elias Settle. Did I do that right? No, what's your first name? Aaliyah, excuse me, okay and Jaden Yates. Thank you all for coming. Okay, moving on to um, public participation and recognition. Of, I'm sorry, moving on. To, is there anyone that um, wishes to address the board this evening? Cool. Moving on to approving the minutes from prior meeting. Has everyone had a chance to read those and are there any changes or additions? Hearing none, I look for a motion to approve the minutes from prior meetings as listed. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Mr. Kirk. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Minutes approved. Moving on to reports. The first one we have is a miscellaneous capital projects update. And looks like we got Craig Thomas. Hey, Mr. Craig. first one is the safety of grades and secured entrances that we're doing throughout the district. Uh, you have four items that we need to do. Um, before we do that, just want to go over it just a little bit. The project went out to bid. We thought we were going to get four bids. We ended up with two bidders. The low bid is ADP out of Henderson. A total of $327,900 was their base bid. And then the uh, alternate one, which was a particular type of exit device was cost $6,500, and then the card readers was a zero dollar time. So we would recommend that we enter into a contract with ADP for both the base bid and alternate one. Alternate two is already included because it's a zero charge. So we would recommend doing both of those. We do have, um, we gave them a couple options at bid date on how they can proceed to get the project done based upon school starting and things of that nature. We work with Donnie to be able to do that. Once we get approved from Frankfurt, we will be able to move the project forward while school is in session, such as rest of the summer, and we'll work through to, to, to get it done, and they're going to use the break, fall, Christmas, spring break. Plus, there's a couple of schools they can work without affecting, pick that drop off, and exiting to be able to get that done. So we feel comfortable and confident we'll be able to get the project done. Unfortunately, it won't happen during the summer. It'll happen throughout the year. So with that being said, you've actually had a second bid for special inspections. And I think that special, that second bid, we actually received three bids with the lowest for $800 um, for um, special inspection services. We do kind of plan for it, it does go up. 
And so with that being said, we're going to we're going to ask you to approve the bids for the secure entity. We're going to ask you to approve the revised BG1 and then approve the contract with the owner contractor and then approve the special inspection. So Madam Chair, members of the board, I respectfully request you approve the bids for secure entrances projects as presented by Craig Thomas. Um, Beth, do we need to read those numbers into the into that? I can do it. It's, it's no big deal. Okay, so we look for a motion to approve um, BG19-053, which is safety upgrades for secure project entrances, approve bids for the secure project um, with AVP, approve the revised BG1 for secure entrances, and approve the owner contract agreement, and approve the special inspections bid for the special entrances, all of those together. Do I hear a motion to that effect? Thank you, Mr. Mike. I'll second that. All in favor, say aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to the North Middle School roofing project. Thank you. We received two bids. Again, we thought we were going to get three. We ended up with two. They were extremely high. Um, preferred construction services out of Henderson was the low bid at $909,900. Uh, BD, the next contractor, uh, roughly $80,000. Immediately upon receiving those bids, we started looking at what we could do to bring those down. So tonight, what we're going to ask you to do is award the project to um, preferred construction and then also approve a, a change order to reduce their contract, I believe, roughly by $100,000, which will help bring this project maximum to budget. Uh, does that make sense? Questions? Board members? Madam Chair, members of the board, I ask that we approve the bids for North Middle School. We approve a revised BG1 for North Middle School roofing project and approve the change order for North Middle School to bring it, the contract back into a reasonable price. Do I hear a motion to that effect, please? On the owner contract? And approve the owner contract agreement. Yes, yes, and approve the owner contract agreement between North Middle right. School Ruffin right. Project. Right. Do I hear a motion to that effect, please? Thank you, Ms. Tracy. Any second? Thank you, Mr. Mike. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. What about those capital funds request? Is there a capital funds, approve a capital funds request for that? No? Oh, that's the recycling bin. Okay. So we got so many BGs in here, it's easy to get the last one. Okay, so moving on to soccer field lighting at the Henderson County High School. That's the final piece for, for us. Actually, on bid day, we were expecting only to receive one bid, and we actually had a nice surprise and ended up receiving three bids. So we were very happy in, in regards to that. Uh, the two extra bids were both Groves Electric and um, Premier Electric, and both of those were lower than the bid we were expecting for Mike Electric. So we would ask that you all approve Groves Electric out of Massonville in the amount of $118,878. And again, this is a project that they'll have to do throughout the soccer season just so that you all know how it's going to uh, take place. They already have both Boys and Girls scheduled. They know they can only do one array at a time. There's four poles out there. Each pole has one array on it. They're going to take down the soccer array and put the next, the new one in its place. And they'll do that for each pole within a day. And so you won't miss any games, and you'll be able to operate the field when they leave there that day. That array will be operational. Now keep in mind, you look at the arrays on the baseball field, two poles that serve the baseball field and the soccer field have two sets of arrays on them. We're only changing out the soccer array. And by array, I'm talking about the structure you see that has all the lights on it. That whole piece comes down, a new one goes up, and fastens to the pole. So we should be fine. Now, it will take about four to six weeks before the arrays show up once we get ADU approval on that project. Madam Chair, 
Madam Chair, members of the board, I request your approval of bids for the soccer field lighting at Henderson County High School, approve the owner contract agreement for the soccer field lighting, approve the revised BG1 for the soccer field lighting, and the capital funds request. Questions? Go ahead, Kurt. How soon would it be uh, so that we can host tournaments here? Is it possible to do that this year, that we would be a consideration? Yes. The lighting should be done before the season does. Well, it depends on how long is the spring plan. You know, we do have a spring plan in place for that as to the lighting. Any, any other questions? Hearing none, I look for a motion to approve the um, bid items and owner contracts as listed uh, by Ms. Stantler. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Moving on to Jefferson, New Jefferson Elementary. Project update, Mr. Jeff. Good evening. I only have one item to uh, put before you this evening. I have a request that you approve uh, a not to exceed price of $22,875 for the completion of a geo thermal test well and conductivity test. Uh, that information is needed by uh, the mechanical and uh, the HVAC designers to be able to put together the details for the geothermal system. We are diligently searching for a second price that we hope will be lower than, than the one that's before you right now, um, but would like your approval uh, if we cannot find that price, uh, get a lower price to use the one that we currently have. Any questions about that, board members? Okay, um, look for a motion to approve the geothermal test well um, as listed. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Try to find it as cheaper if you can, but don't stop the project because of this, I think is what, what okay. Okay, moving on to Henderson County High School Athletic Report. Mr. Jeff Corson. Probably the shortest report you'll receive from me. <laughs> it's summertime, it's okay. And I'm not asking for any money. Um, uh, as you can see before you, uh, all of our uh, athletic activities have just gotten off dead period last Wednesday. Um, and uh, they just basically been in conditioning, going to camps this summer um, and participating in uh, summer games. Uh, we had two boys soccer players, uh, Trevor Book and, and Ashton Todd, who were selected uh, for the uh, United States um, soccer team and uh, that participated in Europe uh, you know, last, uh, last week. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, congratulations to them uh, as they represent not only Henderson County, but also uh, the United States uh, over in Europe. Uh, our fall sports actually uh, got in full swing today. Uh, and uh, with the weather holding out, we were able to get some tryouts done uh, for soccer. Uh, football was out uh, doing uh, just some workouts and then uh, also volleyball uh, as well. So, and uh, just kind of help answer your question is that uh, based on the scenario of the lighting, uh, the, the regional tournament, which are we're hoping to host for the boys this season, in fact, uh, that's already on the schedule for us to host it, that the lights, if barring any trouble, should, worst case scenario, probably the middle of September uh, is what we're looking at. So we should be good, barring any trouble. So we pray that you know, there, there's no trouble. All right, uh, any questions or Thank you, Mr. Jeff. 
And a trip report. Sure. Madam Chair, members of the board, there are most all members of the delegation are here this evening are going to take part in the presentation. So I'm going to ask in a minute that maybe they come up and at least sit in that front row or come stand beside me. But I also know that in uh, my contract, the superintendent's contract, it states that at any time that I'm gone for professional development for an extended period of time, that that's noted in the minutes. And so I would request that that's okay that Ms. Newton puts those in the minutes that the superintendent was gone on the China trip and the delegation when it did exceed five days. So, awesome. So if the delegation will come and join me up here, one of the first things that we want to share with this board is to thank you. Um, thank you for a very unique um, and amazing opportunity. This trip was incredible, absolutely an incredible experience. And in the picture that you see, this is um, the Henderson County Schools delegation, along with, we traveled with Kenton County Public Schools and Russell Independent Public Schools. And then there were five University of Kentucky students who were studying abroad while we were there. Now, the director of the University of Kentucky Confucius Institute is Dr. Washing Maskey. And she is in the front row. It would be on your far right-hand side. And she is um, a ball of energy and a class act. She knew very well. She grew up in China, but she's very westernized in, in her ways. And she knew very well how to navigate uh, around the political aspect between, obviously, what's going on right now and her home village, you know, that she was raised in and her love for China. So we left um, Henderson on June 11th, and our first stop was Shanghai. As Megan's coming forward, I feel like that you all know the delegation, but I'll introduce them. This is Megan, of course, Megan Mortis, Nancy Gibson, then we have Chad Thompson and Boone traveled with us also to China, his son. Lindsay Thompson and Piper traveled with us. And then we have Laura Rideout. She is a fourth grade teacher at A.B. Chandler Elementary. And her husband, Andy Rideout, traveled with us uh, to China. And he is a part of the Co-op Extension Office in Henderson. Um, Brandy Haley, you know, is the principal. Brian Bailey and his wife, Ashley and daughter Kate traveled with us. And then um, thanks to Mr. Haynes' suggestion, uh, Jennifer Preston and Kent Preston and their daughter Sophia traveled with us. And there were really good outcomes from that idea. So, <laughs> all right, Megan, what happens in Shanghai? After a 14 hour flight, we arrived at one of the largest cities in China, Shanghai, with a population of 26.32 million. It's also one of the most cosmopolitan, offering uh, visitors a chance to not only see the past, but they can see the present and future all at once. The river there splits Shanghai into two districts. On one side of the river, it's very futuristic, as you can see. And the other side, the Bund, Bund River side, you get a taste of old Shanghai. And during the 1920s and 30s, Shanghai became known as the Paris of the East and the New York of the West. And our first big stop in Shanghai was Donning International Elementary School. I thought since we are educators, we needed to talk about the real reason we were there. And, and again, thank you for making that possible for us to travel to China. Um, it was certainly an experience to get to visit Danning International School, uh, which is, which was probably considered the most westernized school that we visited. So uh, that was certainly uh, important to see that first. If you notice in the picture, Dr. Maskey is to your far right. The principal is in the middle of the three ladies. And then the lady to her right is uh, her interpreter. And um, as they were talking to us, they explained that the school philosophy is smile every day. And uh, that resonated with all of us because we especially think about our ESL students and we know that 
uh, we all smile in the same language. And when our s students, our children, saw their children, the smiles were contagious. Uh, through the curriculum, the student is expected to have a healthy body and mind as well as a sound personality, have a sense of responsibility towards self, others, and the society, be able to communicate and express in an effective and a positive manner, and have solid knowledge and skills, critical thinking and problem solving skills. Sound familiar? Uh, I share with you on this slide, this, uh, the, the piece on the right is, is just part of their strategic plan or their vision, uh, very much like ours. Their educational characteristics of the school are international, artistic, and personalized. The other um, picture that I felt was important for you to see is they're very much dual language. It's uh, Chinese language and writing as well as uh, English language. Uh, they go hand in hand and throughout the day. So when you're seeing those posters there, those are like what we would have uh, um, a service learning event or a literacy night, and they're by grade level. So everything is in the English language uh, promoting whatever, whatever their initiative is. Uh, the educational objective uh, is turning our, and this is exactly how it's worded, turning our students into little modern citizens who are diligent, kind-hearted, responsible, and healthy both physically and mentally with international perspective, national spirit, and traits. If you'll look at the next slide, they're uh, not only are, are they very strong in content, but they strongly recognize the arts and humanities. And uh, throughout the day, they have 70 minutes for lunch and enrich what we would call enrichment time. And their enrichment time would include music, dance, theater, calligraphy, and um, uh, learning Chinese, the Chinese game called Go. And uh, as we we uh, know about the Chinese people is they really it's really important to sharpen their strategies and so go is uh, a, the game there that you see with the table and the board and they have little chips little white and black chips that um, they play this game with and we have several in our group that purchased one of those games and brought them back with them I don't think anybody's had time to play yet the next slide is just a little bit about what I've talked about. You see some of our students or our, our kids, I call them our kids because they became all of our kids while we were there, uh, playing some of the instruments. Uh, you also see the um, Chinese calligraphy, which is the Chinese alphabet. And then the uh, fluorescent lighting, that's an, one of the entrances into the media center. And the next couple of pictures are just more uh, pictures of the media center. You see that it's it's two story and has a very inviting slide that we'd all like to go down. Some did. Piper and Boone definitely did. Uh, also in their media center, they have books. All of their books are in Chinese as well as in English. This was uh, something we wanted to share because we all know that once a teacher, always a teacher. And Mrs. Stanley, is, if she has kids around, she finds a teachable moment. So uh, we had been learning um, how to count in Chinese on the bus, and we had lessons every day. She's letting them count. One thing I wanted to point out there is, like I said, once a teacher, always a teacher. She, one of the kids made a little mistake and said 11, jumped from 9 to 11. So she did the little uh, correction, immediate, specific feedback, and, and corrected that misconception right away. Uh, as you can see in these pictures, the smile is, um, is in the same in every language. 
they were wonderful hosts. The kids made us all feel welcome, the, and they certainly made the, our, our kids feel welcome. Uh, Boone and Piper and Kate just jumped right in and, and played games with them, and uh, they were talking about how old they were and what grade they were in, so it was, it was a, a fabulous experience. And of course, as educators, we've always got to check out the cafeteria especially with the fact that we've built one school and you are on your uh, way to building another new school. We learned in their cafeteria that they also serve uh, Western food. They, tr they serve the traditional Chinese food, but they serve Western uh, food as well. They um, offer chopsticks and uh, they even um, offer forks and, and Westernized um, silverware. Rice is more commonly grown in the Shanghai area, so uh, it, uh, you will find most products more on the rice. It's usually a little lighter, and then when you travel to the other parts, uh, you'll find more of the Chinese noodles because of more wheat products are produced there. Um, the Shanghainese are known for having a real sweet tooth, and sweet tooth really isn't something that's common in China, uh, when we would have our meals most of the time, or all of the time, if you had a dessert, it was a wedge of watermelon, sometimes an orange, which was good for me, but I know some of the other people might have wanted something a little sweeter. <laughs> but um, the Shanghainese are, are uh, they have a sweet tooth, and they're known to have a little more sugar in their diet than other parts of China. In the center of Nanning, elementary is this beautiful sanctuary that uh, surrounded by a goldfish pond and lots of lily pads and it was it was just uh, fabulous to think that that was a retreat right in the center of the school the other thing that we really noticed and respected was the f their um, appreciation for what little green spaces they had every inch of a of a space that they could grow veg gr excuse me grow vegetation they certainly took advantage of it this is on a rooftop um, there were several of them in the schools but also when you're just driving down the road uh, Andy right out of course pointed out all this to us but every space like a median in between the highways that was a space that was used um, to grow. Uh, fruits and vegetables. So with a um, population that high, it certainly was important to, to efficiently use all of their green spaces. The, the next uh, adventure for that day is we were invited by the Shanghai University for our first official Chinese dinner. It was lunch, but it was a dinner. So typically, all of our meals while we were in China are served family style with you see the Lucy, the Lucy, the lazy Susan, in the center, and uh, the servers would would start uh, passing out the dishes, and in most cases they didn't have like serving spoons. You were just to use chopsticks and serve yourself. We had some there that was their first time to ever experience uh, chopsticks. If you know Andy right out, you might ask him how that went. But I want you to know, by the end of the trip, he was, he was proficient. <laughs> uh, as far as some of our crew, this was the first time, our first meal, and they did not give us any forks. But, you know, uh, Miss Miss um, Stanley, she never uh, is unprepared. She has a little plastic fork in her purse, and she <laughs> shared it with anybody that needed one. So she had a couple in there. One other thing I want to point out are just some of the dishes that we had while we were hosted by the Shanghai University was jellyfish, the lotus root, which kind of looked like spam, um, loofah, and uh, they had this fish, the whole fish, the head of the fish, the entire fish. <laughs> and they take this fish, and he's about this big, and they cut him diagonally. <laughs> and then they dip him in some type of flour, and then they f fry him in a pan. He looks like a blooming onion when he comes out, and he's all curled up, and you just take your chopsticks and pull off a little chunk. How was it, folks? Yeah, it was pretty good. Boone, Boone, <laughs> Boone, what was your experience? 
say, Boone, what was your experience with jellyfish? I didn't you did not. <laughs> but he tried it. I heard I heard you split it with somebody. Did you did you share with somebody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a sneaky way to get away with that. <laughs> After we finished our luncheon, then we went over to to um, the the College of, of uh, Economy, and we met with the professor of uh, of, of economy, and he s he talked to us about the Chinese economy. He talked to us about uh, <laughs> since the um, the fall of, of of Ming in 1978, when China opened up and started the globalization, uh, and just the incredible increase in population and um, their their global economy. So it was a quite an eventful day, and we'll finish with Miss. Mortis, excuse me. Oops, okay. So after lunch, we, or the next day, excuse me, we visited the Shanghai Museum. It's a large museum of ancient Chinese art, and it is famous for its ceramics, paintings, calligraphy. We learned a little bit more about the culture and the symbol symbols in China, such as the color red, symbolizing good fortune and joy, yellow, is the emperor's color, and you'll see yellow, and yellow often decorating royal palaces, altars, and temples. We also learned about the four gentlemen, and the four gentlemen in Chinese paintings refer to the four different plants of exemplary conduct and nobility of character, and they are orchid, bamboo, crescinium, and plum blossom. They represent seasons, and they also represent different character. So this evening you have bamboo, and that stands for integrity and wisdom. China is one of the earliest countries to use currency, and the nearly 7,000 pieces in the gallery there in Shanghai Museum, we were able to see and learn about the economic exchange between China and other countries. Dr. Maskey also provided us with a very in-depth um, conversation about the meaning of calligraphy and the meaning of artwork. Um, it was a very personalized tour there at the museum. And then next, we went to the Oriental Pearl Tower which was one of the largest um, towers in um, China until 19 or 2007, when it, it was surpassed by the Shanghai World Financial Center. The tower is um, lit up brightly at night with LED lights. It also has a glass bottom floor. Most everyone walked on that um, and looked down. Yeah, I don't really, I didn't look down much on that one. <laughs> And like Ms. Gibson said earlier, we have um, lots of um, landscape and, and landscape architecture that you notice there's a picture in the center of the square. And on the slide before, you actually saw, can you notice Mickey Mouse in there? Little Mickey Mouse ears. Um, they have a lot of attention to detail in their designs of their buildings and also in their, their floral designs. And then we were able to go on a river cruise there at night and see Shanghai lit up at night. Shanghai was the most western city that we visited, so it was a very nice transition for the beginning of our journey. Next. Oh, I get day two. <laughs> yeah. So on day two, we got to travel to a city called Hangzhou. And uh, what was interesting about the travel to Hangzhou was this a lot of our first time, I mean all of our first time experiencing traveling on a bullet train. And a lot of, a lot of us had been on Amtrak bef before, but if you know the uh, rail system in China, the bullet train actually travels 350 kilometers per hour. So if you can do that equation, it's around 217 miles an hour. So that was interesting. Um, we figured out really fast that we had to focus on things far away out the window. It's really hard to take a picture traveling at 200, a little over 200 miles an hour. But it only took us a little over an hour to travel from Shanghai to Hangzhou. And uh, the purpose of visiting Hangzhou was to visit uh, Aisho English schools. And if you recall, uh, during the presentation that I presented to you before our trip, uh, I introduced to you an experience that uh, my family had uh, where we hosted Mrs. Sunny Wong, and she spent some time here in Henderson County Schools. She works for iShow English. 
Uh, I show English is a private school that was started by Mr. Andy Tan, who's a philanthropist and uh, very and a very successful technology entrepreneur in Hangzhou, and um, they focus on teaching schools in several different methods, specifically English in several different methods. They have offline schools. They have 40 uh, traditional brick and mortar buildings where students attend each and every evening after their normal uh, school time. They also spend time in those schools on Saturdays. This happened to be a Saturday when we were there. Uh, each classroom was filled with uh, about 12 to 15 students, ranging anywhere from age of five to nine years old. And they primarily had a facilitator in the classroom learning, utilizing technology. Uh, the technology that was utilized, as you can see, is a traditional projector and whiteboard. Uh, they used a lot of animations in their learning. Another place that we visited with the iShow Corporation was their company headquarters where they sat with us, talked us to us about their mission, vision, their history um, as they got started fresh out of college. Uh, Mr. Andy and his business partner, Lincoln, as they became more successful and developed the company and where they wanted to go to the future. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have had the opportunity to um, watch what's been in the news recently with the, um, the uh, influx of artificial intelligence in our technological world around us, uh, but the Chinese culture is really embracing that from an educational perspective. Uh, and, and iShow is really focusing on utilizing artificial intelligence through their deliver delivery capabilities to reach the masses of their population because they have such a, a teacher shortage. Uh, they have in instances where one teacher is using technology to reach 1,500 students using technology and artificial intelligence. We also had some time to visit a teacher preparation facility. So we visited three, three of their facilities before lunch that day. And in that facility, we, uh, because it was a Saturday, class was not in session, but we got to tour the facility and learn where they take current college students and train them on how to use technology to teach English for their schools. We had some time after our visit to uh, the classroom to sit around, have some discussion, uh, to learn about those philosophical differences and those, the things, the likenesses that we're also using as far as technology is concerned, and uh, really go uh, leave that experience with an understanding of how they are embracing technology to move forward in one or a few aspects of education in China. That afternoon after lunch, we did visit West Lake. Uh, West Lake is actually a man-made lake. A little known fact about Hangzhou is it's known in China as heaven on earth. Uh, at West Lake, our children got a chance to interact with other Chinese children, the children of uh, Miss Sunny here, who you see in the picture with Peppa Pig. Uh, that's actually, there's a little backstory about that as well. They're using the artificial intelligence and the animations uh, as a demonstration during this time. I show is actually in negotiations or we're in the final stages of negotiations during our visit uh, for securing a licensing deal with the developers of Peppa Pig to use in their animations. I will turn it over to Xi'an and I would also like to say thank you for the opportunity. So we left Shanghai and we flew to Xi'an. Um, Xi'an is located in central China and it's actually the smallest city that we visited. It has a population of 13 million people. It was the smallest, yes ma'am. So today, Xi'an is very vibrant. It's a modern city, but it's surrounded by lots of history. If you look in the bottom left-hand corner there of the PowerPoint, um, we have Muslim Street. This is one of the liveliest areas of Xi'an um, called the Muslim Street Market. It has a long history dating back over a thousand years and is the hub of the Muslim community in this city. Um, it's famous for its delicious food and right there in the center that is caramelized squid on a stick. You could pretty much find anything on a stick in, Muslim, in the Muslim streets and you can find all the trendy products. So we purchased a lot of souvenirs here in Xi'an. The top left hand there is the drum tower and this is, was built back in 1380, the Ming Dynasty, and it has been renovated twice since then, once in 1644 
and then again in 1911. And it faces its twin tower known as the Bell Tower. And so the significance here is in ancient times, the Bell Tower was rang in the morning to give the morning time to the um, people in Xi'an. And then in the evening, the drum tower, the drums were beaten to give them the time of the evening, just to kind of let the people know what time of day it was. And one of the main attractions in Xi'an is the city wall. You see those pictures there. Um, it is the most complete city wall that has still survived in China. Um, it's known for its military um, defense systems. Um, it surrounds the old city in a large square area. It has watchtowers at the four uh, corners and also gates. Um, and there are 98 flanking towers in between um, that were built the exact distance apart where an arrow could travel. So it's known for its um, defense and strategy. Um, today, you can uh, walk along the top part of the city wall. You can also ride bikes that like you see in the bottom corner. And it's also a very popular place for the uh, residents of Xi'an to meet in the mornings uh, for daily exercise and for uh, kind of social gatherings. And then um, also in Xi'an, um, I thought this was one of the most um, exciting days. We got to visit the village school in Xi'an, and this school is only accessible through that path. You see us walking there. And um, we walk through farms and um, trees and, and things there to get there. Um, and President Bill Clinton visited this site, uh, this school, excuse me, in uh, the late 1990s. And they're very proud of that fact. And they still have a bulletin board as you entered the school with uh, President Clinton's picture on it as well. Um, this school is, uh, campus is very different from the um, uh, school that Nancy shared with us. Um, it's very rustic. Um, it doesn't have a main roof over it, so as soon as you walked out of the classrooms, you were outside. Um, the bathrooms were more like outhouses, um, and there isn't a cafeteria, so the students go home every day uh, for lunch. Um, so very different um, in the campus building. But a few things uh, were very similar to the other school. Um, the students were extremely welcoming, as well as the staff, um, extremely friendly. Um, uh, in the bottom corner there, you see uh, the little boy, looks like he's rubbing his eyes, but he's actually doing eye exercises, and um, we found out the government requires these eye exercises to help combat the problem of so many uh, Chinese people needing glasses, and so we saw at both elementary schools that they did that as well as the high school, so we don't know what the success is that with that is, but um, that's one of their um, directives from the government that they do. Um, we did not see a lot of technology used in the schools. Um, in the classroom I was in, I saw a document camera being used, um, and that was about it. But uh, we didn't see students having devices or using technology um, in the schools that we visited. And then um, the students are allotted a time every day to learn English. And um, in this particular class, they were about to have a Chinese lesson, but the teacher changed it to an English lesson so the students could have conversations with us. Um, and this was great um, to sit with the kids, and they pulled out their English workbooks and tried to read in English to us. We could draw pictures for them, and they tried to say the word in English. Uh, we shared magic tricks. We gave them little gifts that we had brought. Um, so it was great to have that conversation with them and try to figure out what they were saying, and they were trying to... Um, talk with us as well. And their motto at that school is study every day and grow every day. Okay, and then we also uh, that same day went to the Terracotta uh, Warrior um, site. Um, and this is uh, one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Um, it was constructed um, about 2200 years ago uh, by China's first emperor, Emperor Qin, uh, when he was just 13 when he took the throne. He wanted to be protected in his um, afterlife, so he had this army constructed um, and buried uh, where he would be buried. Um, and what's, I think, pretty amazing is it took over 700,000 people 38 years to construct this army, and no two soldiers are alike. Uh, they're different with their facial expressions, their clothing, um, their hairstyle, um, makes them all, each one unique. And um, there's also horses and chariots, um, and it was neat to see the um, archaeologists actually, they're still working, they're still excavating and restoring pieces that they find. And they've even found um, 
acrobats and musicians in the last pit that was discovered, um, and this emperor wanted to have his grand life in his afterlife as well and be um, entertained, and this was all found by a farmer who was digging a well and discovered um, the terracotta warriors. Also during our time in Xi'an, we actually visited a high school, the Gaoshan Number One High School. Um, it was established in 1995, and it's located right in the middle of the Xi'an High Tech Industries Development Zone. Um, under the school, there are three middle schools, two high schools. They have around 6,000 students and 4,000 staff members. Um, besides the normal Chinese routines, um, they have exchange programs through the school. That they send some of their students to um, Singapore, Australia, America, other countries, and of course, we send some of our American students to this, this school as well. Um, back in 2016, this high school was actually ranked 31 in mainland China, based on terms of number of students entering top American universities. And during our time at the school, we were able to get our first hand experience going to some classrooms. We went in groups of two and we were able to sit in and um, kind of see how their instruction was. This classroom that I went in, there were actually 53 students to one teacher and back to the eye exercises, 33 of those students had glasses. So that was kind of going back to what Laura shared. Um, interesting, they go to school here from 7.30 until 6.30 with a two-hour lunch, but then many of them, if not all of them, go home in the evening to three to four hours of homework. So school was very important. And then after our time in the classroom, we were able to come back to the conference room and sit down with the principal. She's there at the head of the table, and she has her cell phone, and I'll explain that in a moment. And then some of the teachers, just to kind of ask questions about their curriculum, instruction, just teaching students in China. So cell phones weren't allowed, but um, the principal there has her cell phone because they had just finished their high school big test called the Gao Cal. And so she was getting results to see where students were going to be attending universities. So she was pretty excited about that. So I failed to mention that the classrooms, the students actually stayed in the classroom. They didn't move from classroom to classroom. The teachers actually rotated, and each class was 45 minutes. So, yes, I was in there about two hours. Myself and my buddy Sean were hanging out in chemistry, physics, and calculus. So we had a great experience. I'm um, thankful to Megan. She was looking around at every room, and she found us, and she was like, come on. So Megan saved us. And then our last adventure in Xi'an was the Neolithic Village Museum. And this was built around a historical site consisting of the remains of a 6,000-year-old village and it was actually the first pre prehistoric museum built in China. All right, now we're on to Beijing. Um, as you can see here in the, on the screen, those are called uh, hutongs, and in China, that is a name given to what we would think of a neighborhood in ancient China is given to a narrow lane alley or a small street between rows of single stories, uh, single story homes that were developed by uh, people that live in Beijing. So when you look at it, they're interlaced in each one of those. Um, there were some of them are very interesting when you get to walking down the street. You'll kind of see a picture here in a minute of what those look like. Some are very modernized um, to the degree that they can, but some of them are still kept in the same architecture and also in the same um, uh, look that they had um, 2,000 years ago. Uh, and 
lot of very interesting stories and a lot of uh, famous uh, or infamous Chinese emperors and, and some of their government lived in some of these hutongs. Here's some more pictures you can see on the left. Uh, that was one of the uh, streets going down the hutong. You can see another map where the kids are standing on the right. That is exactly what it looked like down those little alleys. Um, be cars or bicycles, motorcycles parked, and then on the left side there would be doorways that would go into these little houses, and then they would enter into a courtyard, and then inside that courtyard there would be several rooms off of that where extended families would be staying. Uh, one thing that I think freaked Piper out a little bit, she heard the story that when you walk into a hutong, you will never walk right into one. When you look in the door, you will see a wall in front of you, and you will either have to turn left or right. Because the Chinese people, I wouldn't call them religious, I would call them spiritual, and they believe in, in um, feng shui that spirits only can walk in a straight line. They can't turn left or right, so that's when you look in the door of a hutong, you'll always see a wall that blocks the spirit from coming into their hutong. So after that, we traveled um, in the heat of the day to Tiananmen Square. And Tiananmen actually stands for Gate of Heavenly Peace, which I thought was kind of ironic considering what happened there. Um, but Tiananmen Square, the Gate of Heavenly Peace, was a gate in the wall of the Imperial City that was built in 1415 during the Ming Dynasty. The square contains a monument of the people's heroes, the Great Hall of the People, the National Museum of China, and the Mausoleum of Mao Zedong. Um, that was Chairman Mao. He proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China in the square on October 1st, 1941, and that's when it became um, the concrete area that it is today. The Palace Museum and the National Museum housed in the Forbidden City is at the core, and so that is the picture on the bottom left. That's the Palace Museum. Um, in the middle is just the square, and then to the right is sort of is the entrance into the Forbidden City. Uh, it was established, the uh, Palace Museum was established in 1925 after the last emperor of China was evicted from his palace um, and it opens its door to its public. The square itself can house one million people at a time. So that's pretty impressive. Next picture is just us families in Tiananmen Square. All right, and then we went on, and so um, the picture up to the top right is the gate into the Forbidden City. And you'll notice that Chairman Mao is pictured there. And an interesting fact is that it is a painting, and every three years they replace it. So he's still a important figure in their um, society. What are you doing? Where are you going? All right. Um, the bottom right, the Forbidden City has 9,999 rooms. A room consisted of four pillars, so it didn't have to be enclosed. Um, it was built that way because the Chinese are, as Chad said, spiritual um, and a little bit superstitious, and so numbers have different values. The number four, for instance, means death, and so you never want to have a four in anything. Um, a nine is the emperor's number and um, because it's the highest single-digit number. And one is, the imp is God's number. So um, when um, the Ming Dynasty, the emperor of the Ming Dynasty, built his 9,999 uh, forbidden city, he didn't do 10,000 rooms because that would have been offensive to God. Next slide is the Temple of Heaven. Uh, it's one of the most important uh, temples in Beijing. Uh, for the Chinese people. It's where emperors from the Ming and Qing dynasty from about 1420 to about 1900 worshiped the God of heaven and prayed to the, um, the God of harvest. So each year they come in uh, and they have um, ceremonies to um, pray for good harvests each year. But also, as you can see on the left, this is a public um, park, basically. So when you walk in, underneath you see the you see the biggest tower there, but there's a lot of under roof uh, items there. And you'll see a lot of the older generation of Chinese people just lined up playing cards, they're playing poker, they're playing chess, uh, they're playing all different games and they get a little heated. 
uh, we know the students playing these games. They get a little loud, they get a rowdy, but they're having a good time. I can guarantee that. And here you'll see the group picture when we were at Hanbon. And I just mispronounced that. Hanbon. Oh, yeah, she told me. She's like, most people goes Hanban. Uh, but it's Hanbon. It is the headquarters for all of the Confucius um, institutes in all the different countries across the world. Hanbon is committed to the development of Chinese language and culture, teaching resources, and making its services available worldwide, meeting the demands of overseas Chinese leaders, learners to the utmost degree, and to contributing the global culture of diversity and harmony in the Chinese culture. But as you can see, they have all of the different flags from all the different nations, but also they have a museum there. Uh, lower left corner, um, that is um, where you learn acupuncture from. Um, you can't see it, but there are all the little different pressure points. Um, so when the Chinese learn acupuncture, that is a mannequin that has those. The upper left, um, it's, you know, the <laughs> they fix some things and then they mess some things up real bad. <laughs> Um, chrysanthemums, um, they, they, really, um, they really love nature, um, and they mean a lot of things uh, to the Chinese culture. But those are uh, um, some paintings of chrysanthemums. You'll see in the right-hand corner, you'll see Piper in one of the original Chinese dresses. So then we traveled to the Great Wall. So another amazing day very hot. Um, up in the top left is the group when we first got there. Um, and the man, the random man with the umbrella. Um, Chinese people want to be very covered up. Um, so they always have an umbrella. Most have long sleeves, even covering their hands and their feet. And it was excruciatingly hot that day. And so it was in our um, guide, Candy, was fully covered. And Boone asked her why she was fully covered when we were so hot. And what did she say? Um, that if you were tan, then you they would think you would look like a farmer. And that was very negative. So you didn't want to look like you didn't want to be too tanned, or you would look like a farmer. So, right. <laughs> yes. So, traveling the Great Wall, um, we walked and walked and walked and walked, and it was an amazing experience. Um, and then we traveled that afternoon to the Olympic Village. So the top right corner is the 2008 um, bird's nest from the uh, Summer Olympics. And then below that is the, um, the cube where the swimming and diving occurred. And they're all still in use to this day. So it's, it's a wonderful area to go to. Um, and they will have the 2020 Winter Olympics um, next year. And they'll be the first city to, ha to hold both winter and summer Olympics. So that was very cool. And on the bottom right, Piper was over it that day, um, did not want to walk anymore. And so that is Dr. Maskey carrying her. So. So before we uh, end, Boone and Piper, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you in a little bit and ask you what was one of your favorite experiences. So you all think about that as we kind of finish up here. Um, as you can see, our days were very packed. We would leave the hotel every morning, 7, 7.30. We'd return to the hotel, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. We'd pack our backpacks for the day because we knew we would be gone all day. She usually would have two, three, or four things scheduled. There was, she would say, you'll have some free time, and that might be 20 minutes, and you got to be at the bus, like when, you know, just it was just busy 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 and so we could spend talking about any one of those portions of our day for hours and we could give you all the behind the scenes stories and all the bus stories but we're giving you the professional overall sequence of our events tonight and so on our last day on June 23rd it was the longest day of our life it was 24 hours plus 13 coming home so our Sunday was 37 hours that day. Technically, it really was 37 hours. Um, we were expected to be in the hotel lobby by noon, checked out, suitcase in hand to board the bus. 
So we d discovered that we had three hours, four hours of free time. So a group of us decided we're going to the Beijing Zoo because we want to see the panda bears. And we did. We traveled that way and we found them. And, and we realized also there's a story behind the panda bears and the symbolism to China. And that is that it brings friendship and peace throughout the world. And so we were, um, the Chinese people are very kind. They are very hardworking people. And much like Americans throughout our country, the vast majority doesn't necessarily act or believe the way their country leadership does at times but it's the society that they live in, much like the society that we live in. And so there are similarities and difference. With China having a population of 1.4 billion people, so Shanghai is 23, 24 million people, the top 10 populated cities in the United States could fit in Shanghai. So New York, Los Angeles, Houston, Chicago, you could put our top 10 in Shanghai. So it kind of puts in perspective what 1.4 billion people would look like. Um, they often have to compete for their place in line because there's so many people. They hurry to get what they need before the supply runs out or they go early so they can find a place to sit. And that competitive mindset carries into their beliefs in public education. It's very evident. Um, parents compete with others by hiring, as Brian mentioned, private tutoring. The private business entrepreneurship for um, education, it, it just it's, it blossoms over there because the Chinese go to school for a long period of time and then they'll often hire to make sure they can get farther ahead in that, that line. It's a, it's a driving force in their nature. And they will go on Saturdays, as we saw um, at the school in Hangzhou. Compensatory education is required there through ninth grade only. So when you're 14 or 15, that's when it's a big, important time um, in your life. Because at the end of the ninth grade, all students are required to take the Zhang Cao. This is a test that will determine if they're allowed to enter high school. And if they're allowed to enter high school, what high school they can go into. 62% of the Chinese students go on to high school. The other almost 40% do not at age 14 or 15. So it's one of those realizations that we've probably all had that, you know, we see in magazines and we hear on TV and we read research. You cannot compare uh, our educational system to Chinese. You can't compare our high school students to Chinese high school students. And really the conclusion, to me, it's very evident that you, ca you cannot because all of our students at the United States attend public education. And our compensatory education is till grade 12. Um, then, as we already mentioned, when they finish grade 12, they take the Gao Cao test, and then that places them in which university that they will attend. Now, sometimes on their wish list, a university is to come to the United States. And that principal was naming off different universities that certain students um, would be able to attend. Also, another thing that we saw in a realization is we went to a lot of museums and art um, to ancient places that were sightseeing places. But as we listened and we heard the stories behind those, those beliefs um, from the Chinese people that date back to the BC time still are very much fundamental beliefs of their educational system. Um, so how they talk about working to build the Great Wall or the Terracotta Warriors. It's like there's no end to their work until they get ahead. And that is a belief in their educational system. They're, d they're driven by um, just uh, former philosophies and beliefs and their government. As you heard somebody in here mention, the lady talked about what the government, oh, they do the eye exercises because the government demands it. Uh, Trump, I mean, our president would never have that kind of demands on something like that for our students. You know, we would look to the KDE or something, but it's driven by their central government. So as we continue to expand our horizons in the Henderson County Schools, what have we done with this information since we've been back? 
Well, we've already applied for a $25,000 grant from the Preston Foundation um, to request two teachers from the University of Kentucky Confucius Institute. And I think a team here submitted the plan to the University of Kentucky Confucius Institute actually today. And um, if that plan is approved at the University of Kentucky, the Preston Foundation will hopefully grant us our grant of 25000 Each teacher costs 8000 We'd like to place one at A.B. Chandler to start with and one at Henderson County High School to start with. But along with, we'd like to um, purchase some materials, um, some of the art that we've seen, some of the, the music, um, some of the arts and humanities, and the foods. We would expect and want these teachers to do some community things about the different types of um, foods that are very prevalent in the, the Chinese culture. And then, of course, we would hope that next year we would be able to send another delegation and keep moving forward. We've connected with other school districts in Kentucky that have the Confucius Institute as a part of their educational process, and so we're learning from them how to integrate that preschool through grade 12. So our hopes moving forward is starting at A.B. Chandler and at the high school funded by Preston Foundation and um, moving forward. So Boone and Piper, come on up here. What were one of your favorite things about your trip? Yeah, I'm putting them on the spot. Uh, the Great Wall and the Terracotta Warriors. Tell me why, I think I might know, but why did you love the Terracotta Warriors? Because there's this history show that I watch and it talked about the Terracotta Warriors. And what might you possibly want to do when you graduate high school and college? Uh, be a scientist there. And an archaeologist, he told us. Good job. Nice job. We ate jellyfish together. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Piper, what was your favorite part about the trip? Um, the Great Wall and the Terracotta Warriors. Same thing? Same thing. Tell us why. Um, because the Great Wall, um, it was like, it was really long, and all the, all the little houses y you went to, like, that were on the hills, they were really cool because they had all these windows in there, and they would cool you down. And they would cool you down. <laughs> the towers were shaded, <laughs> and it would cool you down. Awesome. We're so glad you went on the trip, and we also enjoyed Kate very much in her perspective. She very much liked those musical instruments. She did. And so that's our presentation this evening. Again, we could give you two hours on every little place we went. And we thank you for your patience and listening to us tonight. We'll do other community presentations. It was an incredible opportunity. And I know that our kids are going to start becoming connected uh, with the Chinese culture. And that will help them to have that world-class education that we want. Thank you. You. I understand Miss Brandy's already making connections so that they can do some Skypes and some um, the new kind of um, letter pen pals, <laughs> electronic pen pals. So yeah, that'd be cool. Thank you, Miss Morgana. Moving on to old business, which I don't think my computer's already died there. There it goes. Um, I don't believe there's any old business to go to this evening. Oh, it's already died. So moving on to new business, the first thing is to um, approve some BGs. Ms. Cindy Clotier. Just ask for approval to approve the BG-5 to close out BG-18-133, the Guaranteed Energy Savings Project. I look for a motion to approve the BG-5. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to use of municipal, municipal golf course for cross-country track. Ms. Morgana. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the boards, I just wanted to give you a little heads up, a little information that um, I have had Coral Haynes, and she is sitting in the audience, um, make contact with me. It's been a few weeks ago about pursuing. It's kind of those what if ideas at this point. What if the city of Henderson would allow us to use the municipal golf course to be a cross-country track? 
what wouldn't that be cool? Similar to like Owensboro has a park or things like that. So I said, well, that's kind of a great idea, but you know, you need to go talk with Mr. Rush and Mr. Thompson and Mr. Corsi and see if if the whole system really wants that. And she did, and they've embraced it, and they think it's a great idea. And so then I said, well, the next step is, and uh, um, Coral Haynes is one of our cross-country coaches, along with a parent. They put a PowerPoint together. And so they are going to go to the city of Henderson next. Now, this is on the understanding that our commitment would be providing transportation, getting our kids there. But the liability piece would be on the city, the maintenance would be on the city, putting up the poles would be on the city. And so we're kind of pushing it towards the city to, be, to do the work and prepare the course. And then she's also expressed that when there's times that our kids aren't using it, the general public would use it for walking trail and, and things like that also. So I just wanted you to be aware that in the school system there is a strong interest for this to happen. We don't know what the city council will think of this idea or proposal, but I wanted you to be aware in case you started to hear things out in the community because the city they are going to go to the city council to give their proposal to see if the city's interested. If the city is interested, then our next step would be to get with Miss Bird and to talk about what kind of contract and agreement we need to formally set up. But I just wanted to give you a little information and see if you had any questions about the proposal and the possibility. And the background is that that is a municipal golf course is not going to be used for golf anymore in the future. That is correct. For, for our understanding, for our understanding they, they might get to the golf. city and do a presentation and then the city has another idea. Most recent is that it's not going to be used for golf, so there would not be any, any interference of golfers and our kids. Oh, no, 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 no. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I see. Yeah, but if you don't follow local news, you may not keep up with that. So, okay. Okay, so that's just for information. And Curl? Correct. Correct. Um, moving on to consent agenda. Approved second reading of a newly recommended KSBA policy update. Review and accept ad, um, administration procedures um, 03.123 AP.2 and 03.223 AP.2. Leave request form and affidavit. Approve grant applications. Approve student overnight trip requests. Approve Kentucky School Boards Association contract for Medicaid training and billing services. Approve school activity fundraiser Fund fundraiser request, um, adopt retiree resolutions, approve trans transportation requests, approve Henderson County School Special Education District procedures, and approve addition of Henderson County Schools Homeschool Academy $100 refundable fee to the Henderson County Schools fee schedule. Now, any of those items need to be pulled or discussed? Um, I will say in full disclosure, um, in using of the transportation requests, one of those involves um, the uses of school buses for the new Henderson County um, Boys and Girls Club, of which I am a part of that board. So uh, does anyone think that I need to recuse myself and not vote for that? No, we're good? Okay, cool. So I look for a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed. Thank you, Mr. West. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Ms. Tracy. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to the financial report, Ms. Cindy. David Treasurer's report for the month of June includes total receipts of $5,155,799 and total expenses of $8,944,235 for a net decrease in all funds of $3,788,436. Any questions? Madam Chair, members of the board, hearing the treasurer's report this evening, I request your approval. I look for a motion to approve the treasurer's report as listed. Thanks, Ms. Tracy. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Mr. Mike. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Moving on to the paid warrant report. Okay, the paid warrant report covers the period of June 11th through July 15th. It includes pay total paid warrants of $4,920,435.76. Any questions on paid warrants? We don't escrow, we 
we say them all out in the Zoom? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ms. Bergen? Madam Chair, members of the board, I respectfully request your approval of the paid warrant report. Look for a motion to approve the paid warrant report as listed. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. I'll second that. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Pay the bills, Ms. Cindy. Um, be it noted that we've received personnel action, and I look for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Oh, my gosh, you too. <laughs> all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you all very much for joining us.